Genesis Heights again uh, using the possessive. Uh, Jotham and Hannah Bemis had been leasing this property, uh, this high ground as well as ground in the River Valley since the 1760s, just after the Seven Years' War had ended and settlement in this region was made safe thanks to the British conquest of uh, New France. Um, so settlement began in this valley starting at the river uh, in the uh, mid-1760s and over time you know people are settling more inland. But again we have another family leasing land although the Nielsen's are thoroughly documented as being quote patriots uh, the, the, the Bemises aren't necessarily you know for one side or the other it's very difficult they're very difficult to pin down and I think uh, in order to try to figure out their loyalties, we have the same problem as those at the time did. Uh, because frankly, Jotham and his wife Hannah were separately and individually called forth to report to either the Committee of Safety and Protection or the New York State Commission for Detecting and Defeating Conspiracies at various times uh, to answer uh, for themselves, you know. Uh, after all, they were accused of being loyalists by some of their neighbors, and they had to answer to this charge. And of course, thinking uh, of having loyalty to the crown, not just actually fighting for the crown, but just thinking of having loyalty to the crown is a crime that you can be punished for. And so they were trying to pin them down regarding their loyalties. And the Bemises were always putting up evidence and people coming to their defense about how they were not loyalists and uh, how uh, they were good, quote, patriots. And, um, you know, who knows? In the end, we'll probably never know. But uh, they were jailed at, at points, uh, uh, both he and his wife, um, Jotham and Hannah. So um, Hannah, at one point, was accused of, and I quote, harboring British officers, quote-unquote, uh, theoretically here at the tavern. They had, they had a tavern down in the valley. Um, you know, so the, you know, when did that happen? Under what circumstances? We don't know, unfortunately. The records are a bit incomplete, but she was brought forth uh, in front of the committee to answer to the charge. It sounds so red scare. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. It's unbelievable. This uh, I, when I do living history, and if, if I portray a, a loyalist uh, soldier with Burgoyne's army, one of the things uh, you know you got to talk about is why are you a loyalist? Why did Americans, some Americans, side with the crown? Because of course people don't default to thinking that it's even possible to say nothing of that it, that it happened and, and why. And my response is, you know, well. You know, I, I don't do first person, by the way, but I say, well, there could be a few reasons why somebody might be loyal to the crown. It could be their religion, it could be this, that, and, and this and that, but it could be things like, um, you know, the upset of the, the government order that, that has been in place for decades and decades and decades, and now uh, usurped by rebels, and I see them as rebels because I, quote, feel I have a duty to my king. That's what one loyalist in Burgoyne's army actually said later in life. I felt I had a duty to my king and therefore took up arms against the rebels. So I say, I felt I had a duty to my king, and these guys are just coming in and creating committees of safety and protection out of nothing. What's their authority to do this? Uh, how is it that because, you know, my next door neighbor or I feel like this revolution is, is inappropriate to one degree or another, how, how could it be that they can be called in, I can be called in to answer to the way I feel? That's not right. But what? They say that they're going to kick us out of our home, sell our property for the public good, quote unquote, uh, because of, of our loyalties. That's not fair, you know. And of course, the audience says, "No, that's not fair." But you know what they don't realize, maybe, is that that's the it's the revolutionary forces doing that, you know. Uh, again, not an advertisement, uh, but if uh, maybe I, uh, we weren't talking about this, of course, uh, in in the visitor center, but from the loyalist perspective. There's a book that we do sell in the bookstore uh, called, um, oh, Jeepers, what is it? It's, it's, it's uh, Women, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the title. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's uh, like a, a thin volume, SUNY Albany Press, two memoirs of two women from the uh, early 19th century reflecting back on things in the 18th century. One of the women's uh, names is Elizabeth Fisher. The other daughters. The other daughters, the other daughters thank you. That's yeah. it, the other daughters of the revolution. Thank you so much, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, yes. And uh, one of them is a transcription of the memoir of Elizabeth Fisher. She was a loyalist woman living in what is now Washington County in Salem. That's where she was living. And um, uh, her husband went off to fight for the British, for Burgoyne. 
she was left behind at home with her daughter, or I think daughter, uh, infant daughter. And next thing she knows, uh, she's getting a knock on her door, and it's the colonel of the local militia with a bunch of guys behind him with, you know, torches, saying, hey, guess what? You're leaving because we know that your husband has sided with the British as a combatant against us, so your property's forfeit. The, what they did was they kicked her out, they took all of the stuff out of the house that they planned to sell at public auction, they burnt her house, and she talks about this in her memoir. Talks about how she sat there looking as they burnt everything after they had taken it all out. Then she was forced to simply go off on her own through the woods. She said that she had silk silk shoes on. They wore out, and then she went the rest of the you know uh, the travels on bare, barefoot, you know, with her infant daughter. And she finally found some guy who claimed that he was bringing cattle to Burgoyne's army because Burgoyne's army they pay in specie money, hard money. And so uh, he was looking to sell the cattle, so she just trusted him. And luckily, things turned out well, and he, you know, they went to join Burgoyne's army, and now she's a refugee. You know, so here's the, and she, it's an amazing, fantastic memoir published in the early 19th century about what she suffered through, and she actually joined Burgoyne's army here at what is now stop number 10 on our tour road, uh, where, you know, Burgoyne's forces are. So it's an amazing primary source from the perspective of a woman, a loyalist woman, a loyalist woman who's being persecuted because of her husband's loyalties uh, by the local authorities. Uh, as for our patriots, uh, the Army of the United States, again, uh, they moved up here, as you know, on the 12th of September, 1777. <clears throat> they moved up here because of the bluffs overlooking the valley, which we'll see in a minute. But I just wanted to show you this. This is why we parked here. Um, on our way, we'll be skirting alongside this ravine. Please do check it out. This ravine is a brilliant natural feature to have in front of your fortification lines. See, when the Americans moved up to Bemis Heights, uh, they made all the, the, the best use of the natural landscape that they could, including building a log wall right along here, right where this uh, trail is, more or less. And to the front of them, they had this naturally cut ravine. They didn't have to dig this. They didn't have to improve it. Uh, they did set an abati down below. An abati is basically when they cut down trees and the large upward pointing branches at when, when they fall are pointing toward where the enemy would approach. So the enemy would have to try to cut through all these ridiculous branches in order to approach the ravine or, or the, the wall on, on top of the hill, you know, whatever it is. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's what they did. And they didn't really have to do much digging because of the strength of the natural landscape provided by nature. And I didn't have to use a shovel. 